Shalom, 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 friends. I am your sister Marie, a child of the Most High God, here to welcome you to Kara Tis Hope Sabbath service. And today we are going to be diving in John 5, guys, John 5. And I'm going to be coming out of the New Living Translation if you wish to join me. If you have not been friends with us as of yet, you have have to get in on this guys you have to join us on facebook and be a part of the daily inspiration that is coming out of the lives of believers as we post scriptures um stories devotionals and just things to water our spirit on a day-to-day basis and if you don't know how to find us all you have to do is go to facebook and look up Tis Hope, and that's T-I-Z-H-O-P-E, and you're going to find a rock with the word hope in the middle, and you've definitely found yourself in the right place, and go ahead and like our page, go ahead and join our page, and be encouraged by our page, and today, we want to also encourage you to get your children involved too. Our Children's Corner has a phenomenal, a phenomenal place that is a great starting point to teach your children in a way that they should go. And that is delivered by Minister Missy. And she is our leader of the children's ministry. So you should definitely get your children involved too. And this is very important time right now where we really need to get our children fed on the word of God. Because as they get older, sometimes we forget in our teenage years or even our early 20s. You know, some of us stay faithful from beginning all the way to the end. But even if they stray away, they have that solid foundation to keep them going in the word of God because the seeds were already planted in their younger years. Get your children involved. Get them on track with God too. Don't keep all of this just for yourself. Get your children involved. So listen, before we just dive into God's marvelous word, let us pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for keeping and covering us as we slumber through the night. Father God, we are coming to you just thanking you right now, thanking you for keeping us and protecting us and guiding us and loving us. Father God, we thank you for providing your word as a book of instructions for us to live by. Father God, write your words in our heart that we may walk them out for the rest of our lives. Father God, I pray today that you penetrate the hearts and minds of those who love you. Father God, give inclination to your children, insight to your children, and just build them up even the more in you. Father God, I pray that you have your way in this atmosphere today. Father, we thank you for who you are, asking that you forgive us for our sins, Father, even though it may be early in the day, Father, or in the afternoon, whoever may be watching, whatever time they're watching, forgive us for our sins, Father God. Put it in your seat of forgetfulness, but strengthen your people like you have never done before in the mighty name of Jesus we come to you. Amen, amen, and amen. Again, if you are just now joining, I am your sister Marie, and today on the Sabbath service, we are going to be attacking John 5. Now, Minister Alex had made it all so clear last week that Jesus Christ's ministry ooh, was all-inclusive. He even went into the level of approaching a Samaritan woman. Now, in that time, Jews had no dealings with Samaritan people, but this is an uncommon Christ we're talking about. This is where Christ is not one that is held by boundaries, and he made this word all good for all to encounter and for all to experience and he gave it to this Samaritan woman and if you haven't had the opportunity to read John 5 or even go over John 5 I really want to encourage you to go back and take a look and be fed and be fed by 
by the word that Minister Alex brought forth last week because it was really good. It showed that we serve a Christ that goes into uncommon places with uncommon people to do his work. And from that conversation with the Samaritan woman, no name. She was identified by her race, not her name. And this woman, after having a conversation with Christ, him going to a place and meeting her where she was, gave her the opportunity to be evangelize the word, the good news. And even with her ugly past, God allowed her, he allowed her word out of her mouth to hold such a weight that it encouraged all who heard to come and see Jesus. Amen. And this is what Christ's ministry is about. He reaches the uncommon person in the uncommon place and bring them into a place of reconciliation and redemption. And this is what the writer John here makes very clear that Christ Christ is the Messiah. Come on. He's good for everybody. And this is just another opportunity for us to see him in his deity. So today, I want you guys to go ahead and join me in the book of John 5, guys. John 5. Five, and it's going to be a pretty lengthy chapter, but we're going to go ahead and we're going to work through this. Amen. So let's start here. So John didn't start off as a disciple um, of one of Christ's disciples, if you may not know. John was the one who came to pave the way for Christ. Now, he was an unorthodox man living in the wild, away from everybody else. He didn't eat like anybody else. You know, he ate wild honey and locusts. He didn't dress like everybody else. He was wrapped in camel's hair with a belt. He was an unorthodox man. And I love how God had him separated from everybody else because I know that many of us go through seasons in our life where he has to separate us from everybody else because there's a certain type of mission or not even just that. We go through wildernesses and some of these wildernesses is for our grooming, our development, our pruning, for him to work on us. But John lived in a wilderness because I guess he was called to be set apart and he did not take on the ways of the Pharisees because his mission was to bring forth the good news of the coming of Christ and letting people know that you needed to repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And this is Christ coming and continuing on the mission that John had set before him. And John made it very clear that he wasn't the Messiah, but he made it very also known to those who heard him that the Messiah was coming. And if the Pharisees really studied the law of the prophets, they would have known that this word was coming to pass, that the Messiah was on the way. Now, they had a hard time accepting Christ when he came because they had their minds focused strictly on the law. And Christ was coming to do a new thing. And we're going to see some of the new things that Christ was called to do in his ministry before his his death, burial, and resurrection. So join me here in chapter 5 of the book of John, and this is right after the book of Luke. Amen. So afterwards, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days, and inside the city near the Sheep Gate was the pool of Bethsaida with five covered porches, crowds of sick people, blind, lame, and paralyzed, laid on the porches. And one of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years, y'all. That's a long time to be in bondage. And when Jesus saw him and knew that he had been ill for a long time, he asked, would you like to get well? 
I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. And Jesus told him, stand up, get, pick up your mat and walk. He told him to stand up, pick up your mat and walk instantly. The man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking, but this miracle happened on the Sabbath, so the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. But he replied, the man who healed me told me, pick up your mat and walk. Who said such a thing as that, they demanded. The man didn't know, for Jesus had disappeared into the crowds. But afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple. And now, I'm told that, excuse me, but afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, now you are well, so stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you. Then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed him. Come on, we're going to stop right there just for a moment. This man has been in bondage for 30 plus years. Two more years, it would have been 40 years total. But this man has been in bondage for 38 years. And there was a river that these people could have gone to. And once it bubbles up, they were getting the water and be healed. But this man didn't have anyone to take him. And this is how Jesus works. Jesus knew that this man was suffering. And he knew that he was suffering for a long time, according to this word. And Jesus found the compassion, even on the Sabbath day. See, Jesus is not one to follow all of the rules of the religious leaders because this is why he was so confrontational. He was obedient to God and God is a God that is always working. And we're going to see that here as the word of God confirms this, but he's always working. He's always doing the will of the father. And this is what Christ was called to. And that was divine obedience. Come on somebody, because of his divine obedience, he also encountered trouble with these leaders because these leaders wanted to put their laws above God. But Jesus found it important as according to the will of God, because if it was his will, then it was God's will first. It was God's will that this man had been saved and healed at that moment. And he gave him a warning. And this is something that I believe that you and I could use. He healed him and told him, now that you are well, stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you. Some, Come on, somebody. Sometimes we are healed and, and it's in our flesh to naturally go back to what we used to do because it's common to our flesh. But Christ is calling him to a higher level. And this is what Christ does. This is what this walk does. It calls us to a higher level because although the grace, the grace is there, there is punishment. There is repercussions for the sins that we live in and the things that we do. So Christ gave this man a new way of living, a new way. He's no longer lame. He is healed. He's walking. And the Pharisees were so strict, so strict to following the law of not doing any work on the Sabbath that they ignored the fact that God encountered, uh, uh, God allowed a miracle, a miracle to take place. Mm. The miracle of God happened, and all they could focus on was breaking of the law. God is not bound by a day. He created that day for rest, but God is a God of love. And God loved um, apparently this man enough that he would work on the Sabbath. 
But this is Christ, y'all. This is God here. God the Son here. He 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 God is always working. God, if God stopped working on the Sabbath, you and I wouldn't have woken up today. If God decided not to work today. This is how God works. So Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. And I know this really made the, the, the Pharisees and these religious leaders upset. Come on. They, they thought that they were the highest of the highest because they were the children of Abraham. And they had the law of Moses. And they had all of this bloodline inheritance. <coughs> but Christ is telling them it's bigger than that. It's bigger than that. And I love that John makes it a point a point to show us that Christ is indeed the Messiah. So the Jewish leaders began harassing Jesus for breaking the Sabbath rules. They put their rules above God. And this is where you mess up. And this is where they messed up more than more to say, because they put their strategic rules. This man is carrying a mat. You want to crucify this man for carrying a mat. You want to crucify Christ for healing somebody on a day that there's no work to be done. Would you have left this man to be lame on the ground for more years? Hasn't he been bound to the ground for long enough? Are your rules that important? That his healing doesn't matter? It was such a level of disconnect. Because they didn't have the heart of God. Because their rules were bigger than God to them. And they seen that Jesus wasn't operating according to their traditions. According to what they believed they were so strict into laws and laws are often broken Christ has came to give grace Christ came to give us redemption Christ came to heal people give their life to Christ on the Sabbath day people get down on their knees and pray people go for a walk and talk to God there's nothing wrong when you're in the business of spending time with God doing God's work, it can't be a problem because you're operating and you're moving in love. And that is the greatest commandment for us to follow. But these leaders weren't trying to hear that because they seen, seen it as Jesus breaking the Sabbath rules. And Jesus replied, my father is always working and so am I. Come on, somebody. So the Jewish leaders tried all the harder to find a way to kill him. They wanted to kill him because he didn't follow the rules the way that they did. You can expect God to move the way that you move. He's so much bigger. He's so much bigger. So the Jewish leaders tried all the harder to find a way to kill him. For he not only broke the Sabbath, but he called God his father, thereby making himself equal to God. So Jesus explained, I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him everything he is doing. In fact, the father will show him how to do even greater works than healing this man. Then you will truly be astonished. For Jesus as the father gives life, excuse me, for just as the father gives life to those he raised from the dead, so the son gives life to anyone he wants. In addition, the father judges no one. Instead, he has given the son absolute authority to judge so that everyone will honor the son just as they honored the father. Anyone who does not honor the son is certainly not honoring the father who sent him. And this is what he's telling to these Pharisees. When you're, when you're not honoring me, you are not honoring God. Most people like to say, oh, I believe in God. But when it comes down to Christ, they want to say that they're spiritual. He said, no, it, it's through me. It's through me that you have eternal life. I am the way. I am the 
truth, and he is the light. Verse 24, he's going to say, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me will have eternal life. And they will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. And I assure you that the time is coming, indeed, it's here now, when the dead will hear my voice and the voice of the Son of God, and those who will listen will live. The Father has life in himself, and he has granted the same life-giving power to him son to his son and he has given him authority to judge everyone because he is the son of man don't be so surprised indeed the time is coming when all of the dead in their graves will hear the voice of god's son and they will rise again those who have done good will rise to experience eternal life and those who have continued in evil will rise to experience judgment. I cannot do nothing on my own. I judge as God tells me. Therefore, my judgment is just because I carry out the will of the one who sent me, not my own will. So Christ is telling you and telling us here that God has given him all authority to be the judge. He's given all authority to be the judge. Not only is he given all authority to be the judge, but he still is connected to the father. He still yields to the will of God. He still yields to that. And this is what you and I are called to do. Not what we want to do, but what God wills for us to do. And it is probably unlikely. It's uncommon. And most people who are walking in religiosity is not going to to see and understand why we are what we are. But that's why we are peculiar. This is also why we are set apart. But Christ is telling you that he has been given authority from on high. But his authority is fair and his authority is just when he judged, because he's not judging according to his will. He's judging according to the will of God. So Jesus witness, the witness to Jesus. Now, it says here in verse 31, if I were to testify on my own behalf, my testimony would not be valid. But someone else is also testifying about me. And I assure you that everything he says about me is true. In fact, you sent investigators to listen to John the Baptist and his testimony about me was true. Of course, I have no need of human witness, but I say these things so that I that you may be saved. John was like a burning and shining lamp, and you were excited for a while about his message, but I have a greater witness than John, my teachings and my miracles. The Father gave me these works to accomplish, and they prove that he sent me. And the Father who sent me has testified about me, and you have never heard his voice or seen him face to face, and you do not have his message in you your heart because you do not believe in me, the one who sent, who he sent to you. You search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point you to me. Yet you refuse to come and receive this life. Your approval means nothing to me because I know you don't have God's love within you. For I have come to you in my father's name and you have rejected me. Yet if others come in their own name, you gladly welcome them. No wonder you can't believe for you got, for you gladly honor each other, but you don't care about the honor that comes from the one who alone is God. Yet it isn't I who will to accuse you before the father. 
Moses will accuse you. Yes, Moses in whom you put your hopes. If you really believed, Moses would believe me. If you really believed Moses, you would believe me. Come on. If you really believed Moses, you would believe me because he wrote about me. But since you don't believe what he wrote, he, how will you believe what I say? And I'm sorry, that got a little tongue tied. I got all these highlighted verses here, and I don't have my glasses on. But he's telling them, I, you, you, you're rejecting God because you're rejecting me. I'm not here to come and boast about myself, but there are those that are going to testify about me. Even the, the very one that you follow the law of, Moses testified about me in Deuteronomy. In the book of Deuteronomy, I believe 1815, he speaks of the prophet. But people in these Pharisees and these religious leaders did not have the heart of God. And Christ was coming to expose the heart of the matter. And if the heart wasn't as important for us, then the first commandment wouldn't be to believe the Lord with all of our heart and all of our soul or believe that we should love our neighbor like we love ourselves. If you love God, you would love his messenger. But just as they killed off so many prophets, even John, he was killed for the good news, for the correction of those who were living in sin, he lost his life and his head. They didn't want to believe any of the prophets who came in the name of the Lord. And here again, we are seeing that they don't even want to accept Christ and his ministry. But he is here to do the will of the Father, no matter who it may offend. I mean, it doesn't matter what tradition he's going against. It doesn't matter how they feel about it because what was important to Christ was what was important to God. He came to do the work of the Lord, no matter if it went against your religion, if it went against your tradition, if it went against what you thought was right, he came to do what the father called him to do and that's what what we're here to do we're called to a level of divine obedience and god calls us his children his children and in divine obedience that means to follow the will of god even if it doesn't feel good to you even if it doesn't feel like you it feels comfortable because sometimes God calls us to do uncomfortable things because that's life. But we know that Jesus' main mission was to do the work of the Lord. And even if that means to break some of the rules of, of the, the, the law of Moses by working on the Sabbath, but God is a God of love. He's bigger than the Sabbath. You can't confine God to just the Sabbath day because God was working. He works every day. There's no days off for God. Rest was for man. Not God. God doesn't get tired. And they couldn't comprehend that. But Jesus came to express his authority to show that he wasn't operating the way that he willed to operate, but he was operating according to the will of God. And today, if it's the will of God for you to give your life to Christ, I pray that you repeat after me. Father God, I come to you a sinner looking to be saved by your grace. For I believe that you are the son. Jesus is the son of God. And he died and he rose on the third day. Today I give you my life in exchange of the Holy Spirit to dwell in me richly, creating me a clean heart 
a renewed mind and the right spirit that my name may be written in the Lamb's book of life. Forgive me for my sins. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If it was what the Father will, and he put it in your heart to will, he put his will in you. If you obeyed that call today, the angels in heaven are rejoicing for your life, and you have made the greatest decision that you could possibly make by saying yes to God, yes to his way, yes to his will. It's up from here. I ain't saying it's easy from here, but it's up from here. Because you may be called to do some radical things. You may be judged and ridiculed by religious people because you are operating according to the will of God, but you continue to be who God called you to be. Because not one of us are the same. And he made no mistakes when he made you. Even with your past, even with you, what you've done yesterday, God is a God of forgiveness. And if you come to him, submitting your sins to him, be honest with him. He's just, and he's ready to forgive you. But I warn you, just as Christ warned the lame man, Go and sin no more. Because what do you do when the repercussions of your sinful living become back to you? We do have the grace of God over our life. We have the grace. It's there for us to have. But don't test the Lord our God. Because he's a forgiving God. I am your sister Marie. If this has generated any questions, please reach out to us. Listen, our website is tishope.org. That's T-I-Z-H-O-P-E dot O-R-G. Get yourself connected to a ministry that loves God and wants to lead everyone, anyone who's willing, back to God with his word, through his, his instruction. But most importantly, get your children connected. Join us. We love you. And we're here to serve you. My cat said good night. <laughs> My cat said good day. But I say good day to you as well. Shabbat shalom. And may the peace and blessings of God rule in your life on the Sabbath. I'm your sister Marie. I love you. But God loves you more than I could ever. Have yourself an amazing day. Amen. Amen.